out on YouTube. Um, needless to say, I didn't call those esteemed colleagues of his psychopaths, as I made clear. Um, in any case, Dr. Clay, Craig has merely defined God as being intrinsically good. It's, if you want to charge someone with merely semantic games, it, it, the, the shoe's on, on the other foot as well. There, there, is, there is no reason that I can see why there couldn't be an evil God, uh, or several. Okay, he, but his God is intrinsically good. Goodness is grounded in his very nature. That is a, 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 definitional, a definitional move that he's made. Now, I have presented a positive case for grounding an objective morality in the context of science. And thinking about moral truth in the context of science should only pose a problem for you if you imagine that a science of morality has to be absolutely self-justifying in a way that no science ever could be. Okay, the, the, every branch of science must rely on certain axiomatic assumptions, okay, certain core values. And a science of morality would be on the same footing as a science of medicine or physics or chemistry. You need only assume that the worst possible misery for everyone is bad and worth avoiding, and indeed the worst case scenario for conscious life. And if science is unscientific, if, this, if, if, if having a, a value assumption at the core renders science unscientific, what is scientific? Now, Dr. Craig is confused about what it means to speak with scientific objectivity about the human condition. He says things like, from the point of view of science, we're just constellations of atoms and we're no more valuable than rats or insects. Okay, as though the only scientifically objective thing that could be said about us is that we're constellations of atoms. Okay, there, there are two very different senses in which we, we use these terms subjective and objective. Okay, there, there's, the, the first is, is epistemological. It, it relates to how we know. And when we say we're reasoning or thinking objectively in this sense, we're talking about, about the style in which we're thinking. We're talking about the fact that we're, we're, we're seeing through our biases, we, uh, we're, we're, which is to say trying to jettison bias. We are reasoning uh, in, in, in a way that's available to the data. Okay, our minds are open to counter arguments. Uh, now, this is, the, this is the absolute foundation of science. And this is what, th this is what opens such an invidious gulf between science and religion, the difference here in this approach to objectivity. But science does not require that we ignore the fact that certain facts are subjective, ontologically subjective. Okay, there, there are facts about the human condition that science can understand and study that are first-person facts, facts about what it's like to be you. Okay, and, and we can study these facts, and our study of them reveals how much deeper and richer and more meaningful our lives are than the lives of cockroaches. Okay, so this, this is a false reductionism that he's purveying here. Now, so there are subjective facts. If you happen to have an intact nervous system, being burned alive will be excruciatingly painful. The painfulness of pain is a subjective fact about you. Okay, I'm, what my argument uh, entails is that there, there are, we can speak objectively about a certain class of, of subjective facts that go by the name of morality, that relate to questions of good and evil. And these depend upon on the well-being of conscious creatures, especially our own. And by this light, we can see that it's possible to value the wrong things. I mean, if you think you prefer to be neurotic and in pain and incapable of creative work and completely disconnected from other people, there's something wrong with you. Okay. Objectively wrong with you? Yes. In, in that you are, you are closed to higher states of consciousness. Higher with respect to what? Higher as in further from the lowest possible state of consciousness, the worst possible misery for everyone. Okay. Is the worst possible misery for everyone really bad? Once again, I, we have hit philosophical bedrock with the shovel of a stupid question.
Now, I want to take a, a brief moment to speak about these higher possibilities because it's often thought that non-believers like myself are closed to some remarkable experiences that religious people have. That's not true. That's not true. I mean, there's nothing that prevents an atheist from experiencing self-transcending love and ecstasy and rapture and awe. There's nothing that prevents an atheist from going into a cave for a year like a proper mystic and, and, and doing nothing but meditate on compassion, say. What atheists don't tend to do is make unjustifiable and unjustified claims about the nature of the cosmos or about the divine origin of certain books on the basis of those experiences. Now, the, the prospect of somebody becoming a true saint in life and, and inspiring people long after their deaths is something that I take very seriously. I mean, I've, I've spent a lot of time studying meditation with some very great, wise old yogis and, and Tibetan lamas who've spent decades on retreat. I mean, really remarkable people. Okay? People who I actually consider to be spiritual geniuses of a certain sort. And so I can well imagine if, if Jesus was a spiritual genius, you know, a palpably non-neurotic and charismatic and wise person, I can well imagine the experience of his disciples. I can well imagine the kind of influence he could have on their lives. Okay? No, we do not have to presuppose anything on insufficient evidence in order to explore this higher terrain of human well-being. We don't have to take anything on faith. We don't have to lie to ourselves or to, to our children about the nature of reality. If we want to understand our situation in the world along with these deeper possibilities, we have to do it in the spirit of science. Okay, given, given that people have had these remarkable experiences in every context, while worshiping one god, while worshiping hundreds, while worshiping none, that proves that, that a deeper principle is at work. That, that the sectarian claims of, of our various religions can't possibly be true in that context. And all we have is human conversation to capture these possibilities. We can either have a first century conversation as dictated by the New Testament or a seventh century conversation as dictated by the Quran or a 21st century conversation that leaves us open to the, the full wealth of human learning. Please think about these things. We're now moving to five minute closing speeches. Timekeeper, are you ready? Okay, begin. In my closing statement, I'd like to try to draw together some of the threads of the debate and see if we can come to some conclusions. First, I argued that God, if he exists, provides the sound foundation for objective moral values and duties. By the time of his last rebuttal, the only argument that I heard Dr. Harris offering against this position is to say that you're merely defining God as good, which is the same fallacy I accused him of uh, committing. I don't think this is the case at all. God is a being worthy of worship. Any being that is not worthy of worship is not God. And therefore, God must be perfectly good and essentially good. More than that, as Anselm saw, God is the greatest conceivable being. And therefore, he is uh, the very paradigm of goodness itself. He is the greatest good. So once you understand the concept of God, you can see that asking, well, why is God good? is sort of like asking, why are all bachelors unmarried? Uh, it's the very concept of the greatest conceivable being, a being worthy of worship that entails the essential goodness of God. And I think it's evident that if God exists then, we do have objective moral values and duties. Secondly, I argued, if God does not exist, we have no foundation for objective moral values or objective moral duties. Um, I showed that on his view, there is, it is logically impossible to say that the moral landscape is identical to the landscape of the flourishing of conscious beings and that therefore his view is incoherent. We also looked at the is-ought distinction and the ought implies can, to which Dr. Harris has never replied in the course of this evening's debate. In his last speech, he said, but we simply must rely upon certain axioms well, that's the same as saying you've got to take it by faith. 
Uh, and if these axioms are moral axioms, then I think he's admitting my point, that on atheism, there simply is no ground for believing the objectivity of moral values and duties. He just takes them by a leap of faith. He says, well, there are different senses of the word objective. Yes, of course, and in my opening speech, I made clear the sense in which I was defining the term. I mean valid and binding, independent of human opinion. And moral values are not objectively binding and valid in that way on atheism. He says science can study subjective facts. For example, pain is a subjective fact. Granted, that's certainly true. So my question is, is the wrongness of an action a subjective fact? On atheism, it's hard to see how it couldn't be any more, anything more than a subjective fact, in which case you cannot say, as Dr. Harris wants to say, and I agree with him that the genital mutilation of little girls is objectively wrong, not just a subjective uh, opinion. He says, well, but uh, if you're psychopathic or neurotic, there's something wrong with you. Granted, I agree with that. There is something wrong with you. But the question is, on atheism, if atheism were true, would there be anything objectively morally wrong with doing what the psychopath does? He hasn't been able to show that. Indeed, there are no moral duties on his view. And remember, he himself admitted that psychopaths could occupy the peaks of well-being on his so-called moral landscape, and that therefore it is not a moral landscape at all. To conclude, I want to quote from a remarkable article that appeared in the Duke Law Journal by uh, Arthur Allen Leff called Unspeakable Ethics, a Natural Law. Dr. Leff's difficulty is the same as Dr. Harris's. He wants to find a foundation for moral values and duties, in this case for the law, that would be uh, independent of human opinion, would be objective and would be in the world, and he can't find one. Uh, he says, any attempt to ground values in the world is open to the playground bullies retort, who says? And this is how his article concludes. All I can say is this, it looks as if we are all we have. Only if ethics were something unspeakable by us, that is something transcendent, could law be unnatural and therefore unchallengeable. As things now stand, everything is up for grabs. Nevertheless, Napalming babies is bad. Starving the poor is wicked. Buying and selling each other is depraved. There is in the world such a thing as evil. All together now, says who? God help us. And now Dr. Harris has five minutes. Timekeeper, are you ready? Begin. I'm curious, how many of you consider yourselves to be devout Muslims? I see a show of hands. Don't mean to single anyone out, but not many. Now, you're all aware, of course, that the Quran exists and claims to be the perfect word of the creator of the universe. You're aware that once having heard this possibility and rejecting it, you're all going to hell for eternity. I mean, needless to say, Dr. Craig and I are both going to hell if this vision of life is true. Okay, the problem is, is that everything Dr. Craig has said tonight, with a few modifications, could be said in defense of Islam, in fact, has been said in defense of Islam. Okay, the logic is exactly the same. We have a book that claims to be the word of the creator of the universe that tells us about the nature of moral reality and how to live within it. But what if, what if Muslims are right? What if Islam is true? Okay, how should we view God in moral terms? How would we view God in moral terms? Or I should say Allah. Okay, we, we have been born in the wrong place to the wrong parents, given the wrong culture, given the wrong theology. Okay, the, needless to say, Dr. Craig is doomed. He's been thoroughly confused by Christianity. I mean, just appreciate what a bad position he's now in to appreciate the true word of God. I've been thoroughly misled by science. Okay, where is Allah's compassion? Right. And yet, in it, it, he's, omni he's omnipotent. He could change this in an instant. He could give us a sign. 
that would convince everyone in this room. And yet he's not going to do it. 